an hour. Wondering why my boss drove the Riviera and I drove the old beater uh, Ford, you know? <laughs> and we'll fast forward about 35 years to today, and I'll tell you that what we're going to talk about in the next hour is going to be pretty, uh, pretty revealing to you. Does anybody ever think that some of their employees are scamming them a little bit for a few bucks here and there? Yeah. One way or another. One way or another? Yeah. You probably got your own stories. Like I got a few stories I'll share with you. And my, one of the rules in my seminars, if you've, got a, if you've got a comment or a question or I hit a nerve, don't wait until we're over with this. Just raise your hand and we'll just, we'll just deal with it right now. You can blurt it right out, okay? Because I think a, a group like this is the perfect size to have people just share ideas with ways to not have too many uh, silent partners. It's hard enough making money... Uh, you know, the way we do it on a normal basis, when we get too many silent partners, we can go out of business in a hurry. <clears throat> what led me to, to develop this seminar is probably five or six years ago. Uh, I'll back up a few years. Uh, in 1988, uh, if you look at the Michigan map, we got a real cool way to do it. The map here, it's a mitten. My pizzeria is right up here on the middle index finger knuckle, right on Lake Huron. Opened it in 75, sold it in 2001. I sold it in 2001 because I was consulting for 10 years, and the consulting that I started out to do for a major distributor was only 30, 40, 50 days a year. And I could work that in real easy. I had a good manager, good store. 1988, it was ranked the 25th busiest independent in the country by Pizza Today. 1990, I started doing this consulting stuff one or two days a week, every other week. No big deal. And it kind of grew, 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 and grew. So I was doing about 100, 125 days a year on the road. In, a 19, in the year 2000, after doing this for about 10, 10, 11 years, I'm going, wow. I'm coming home on a Thursday night, going into my store debriefing with my manager, working all day Friday, all day Saturday, half a day Sunday, going home, doing a load of lights, darks, packing up, and psh, taking off again for another assignment. And this happened for three or four years, and I just got burned out on it. So uh, I decided that I was going to have to cut way back on something. And you can't cut way back on a restaurant if you're the owner of a restaurant. You've got to you know, run that baby almost on a daily, weekly basis. So I brought my wife, CPA, bankers, and all my mentors together and says, what a, what's my choice? And they said, well, sell, stop consulting, or stop being a restaurateur. <clears throat> I said, well, I'll, man, this is my life. I've been doing this since I was 22 years old. It's my life. And uh, they said, well, you only sell two times in your career, when you're at the top of your game or at the bottom of your game. And right now, you're at the top of your game. You've got a brand new 5,000 square foot building. Your sales are good. You're, you're, you know, everything's good. You own the strip plaza. Let's give it a shot. So we had it appraised, and we put a couple hundred thousand extra on top. And lo and behold, seven weeks later, I had a cash fire. So it was kind of like a sign. So on every January 28th at 4.50, and we have a moment of silence when the check cashed. Cool? And you'll be there someday. The two happiest days of your life is the day you've opened and the day you close. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's that? Like you're on a boat, right. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to semi-retire. You know, I was 50-some years old and done it hard and long. And, and I was going to just work with some clients, work with really cool people. And, and man, it's just been busier than I can be. I got another. My next opening's like in June or July. I did come out here a couple, three years ago, or two, three years ago, and work for the Barbagallo family. Anybody? Was anybody there at the Elks Club? Yeah. That was a blizzard day, too, wasn't it? An ugly day? It was a lousy day. Lousy day. <laughs> the good thing is I got kids that live in Manchester and in Boston, so I come out a day early and have a, I spend some time with my kids and grandkids. So yesterday was a birthday party, and I was chalk-covered here when I got here with a can of wax all over, so it was, it was a fun time. Uh, after, after these years of doing this, uh, about... Two years before I stole my store, maybe three years, I don't remember what it was, I had to run to the bank on Friday. If just before the bank closed, you better get your petty cash box re-jammed re up with ones and fives and tens and some change, right? <clears throat> so I grabbed my petty cash big bills, and I wanted to run to the drive through and get small bills and change for the weekend. And I turned, I went out to my blazer and hit the key, and my battery was dead. I left the lights on or something. Wouldn't start. So I went to my main driver, the guy who's been with me five or six years, and said, Bill, loan me your keys. I've got to run to the bank. I've got about eight minutes. So he threw me his keys, and I jumped in his Camaro, and I took off to the bank. And as I'm pulling through the drive through window of the bank, I look up in the sun visor, and what do I see? 
five guest checkbooks. We weren't computerized back then. So we did the same way most a lot of you guys do, you know, with the two copies and the permanent one, guest checkbooks. He had five books up in his sun visor. And that was awful strange because those books are never, ever supposed to leave the restaurant, are they? I mean, that's, that's our check and balance. So as I got my coins and my small bills, I drove off to the side and parked it. And I'm flipping through these books, and I remember making a lot of these pizzas. These are all customers that I know. 10 15 20 $25 orders. Five books. 250 orders. 250 orders at about 20 bucks. What's that, 10 grand? About two grand a book up there. This is the guy that I trust. My main driver, he did all the scheduling. Been with me for years. I stood up for him at his wedding. We're, we're, we're buddies. Trust buddies. And he's got 10 grand worth of stuff. Oh, yeah. And that's the way I'm built. I'm wired that way. I'll trust you until you, until you hurt me. I was blown away, and I still I was just still in denial. You know, there's got to be a reason for this. There's got to be a reason that, you know, he's got these here. Maybe he's doing some old check bags or something. I don't know. But the more I thought about it, I said, there's no reason for this. This is a rule. We cannot, guest checks don't leave the building. So I drove back. Like nothing happened, I just started watching Bill for the next week or so, watching him close. And our drivers, when it's really busy, take orders on the phones, right? Like yours do probably. It gets busy, that driver jumps on there, and the cooks are busy, and the... You know, and, and Bill would wait till it's a medium day and the pizza people are busy and the other phone person's on the line, so he'd grab that phone, thanks for calling Big Dave's, and he'd pull out his own personal book out of his left rear pocket. And he'd do the order. And he'd process the order like normally, you know. Um, the pizza order went to the pizza line, everything but pizza went to the other line, and then he would make sure that he was the one who delivered it. And since he controlled the master, there was no check and balance. A very simple, simple scam. You know how long it takes me to make $10,000 in profit? Because we didn't lose 10000 in gross sales. We lost $10,000 in bottom line. I got to do, what, eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to net ten, And it was tax-free to him. Plus, he's making tips and I'm paying his gas. So after four or five days of watching him coming out of his pocket, I had the police department come in and set up a surveillance camera in the middle of the night and we had him with the meat in his mouth you know doing his thing and we had to prosecute Bill and Bill was no longer with us and away we went so that kind of I started <coughs> compiling all the times I thought in my gut that I was getting ripped off and there's lots of them uh, about a year later when I was doing a lot of consulting I had a client call me from this side of Michigan, over in Traverse City. I was here, she was here. She had four stores. And her four stores were busy but non-profitable. And I deal with a lot of busy but non-profitable, or busy, and busy, busy, but not extremely busy, but she was just cashing in her husband's 401ks to keep the doors open. She was 45, he was 60, they married late in life, he was retired, and they had like three $20,000 CDs left to their name and they're broke. And she called me up after I met her at a food show and says, can you come over here and help me figure out why I'm not making any money? I says, sure. She says, I don't have any money to pay you. And that's how it is. You know, they're just keeping the lights and phone on and making payroll, maybe. So I uh, went over there and I looked at all of her stuff. We weighed out her food. We looked at her menu pricing. And her food cost should have been around 28%. And she was running around paper about 40. She was buying right from her supplier. You know, she was paying the right pricing. Her people were doing pretty good portion control, quite frankly. I was very impressed. So I started doing a checklist of this is what it's not. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. And it brings me down to about the fourth item, which could be theft. And I says, well, Linda, how do you how do, you do your end of the night stuff? And she showed me and watched me. I says, I think you've got a theft problem. <clears throat> I don't think... I don't think it's a food problem. I don't think it's a portion problem. I don't think it's a menu price problem. I don't think it's a coupon problem. I think the kids do so, use those scales when they're making your sandwiches and pizzas, and I think somebody's stealing from you. And this lady is a Catholic lay person, and she loves Jesus with all of her heart. And it's very, very hard for her to fathom that somebody in her crew that she handpicked and loved would do that. But it's not for me, because I'm, I'm tougher and older and been ripped off by my friends. And I said, well, you know, 
when I when I show up on the scene, they know who I am, and they're going to shut right down. This this scam's going to go over until I go away. You know, that's what I would do if I was a thief. But I can bring my manager Joe over here, and nobody knows Joe. You know Joe. You've met my manager. You've been over to my store. But we can pretend to hire in Joe as a new as a new hire, and let Joe work here for four, five, six nights, whatever it takes. You'll have to pay his 300 bucks a week salary and have to buy his room down the room. If I'm breaking even, I just want to make sure you and Billy don't go belly up because they're ready to cash in almost their last CD. And that's, that hurts me to see people, <coughs> good, hard-working people, just lose it. Well, Joe is a little five foot seven Italian guy, the best pizza man, the best driver I ever hired in my life. This guy, he is good. And he walked in, and they hired him as a, like a delivery man, cook's helper. Hell, he could run that place with one arm behind his back. You know what I mean? But they didn't know. And he's really, really friendly. And within about three days, we're checking on voicemail every night, and he's calling me every night at closing. He says, I got it all figured out. The manager's stealing, and the driver's stealing, and it's just two drivers stealing, and the manager's ripping them off, ripping her off about, I'm guessing, four or $500 a day. Yeah, my day. And I said, uh, OK. So we talked about getting a strategy to catch these people. And we went back to, we couldn't get a video camera in there because in my town, I know the cops in Traverse City, I didn't know the cops, you know, but we did get some, we did get some homemade home, home films of them taking food and money out to the dumpster and drop it in the dumpster after closing. Make a long story short, uh, Linda and her husband came to Pizza Expo about two weeks later. Joe was there with me. He was my guest. You know, I bring my manager every year to Pizza Expo. And we sat in my room. And we just showed her all the stuff. And we showed her where she was hemorrhaging and where they were stealing. By the way, Joe stole $300 from her that week. My manager did, yeah. Yeah, he did. And we gave it back to her naturally because that's the honorable thing to do. He says, but I stole this $300. I had unrecorded deliveries. You'll never find them. Because we had to get her attention, you know what I mean? Because she's in denial big time. So I stole 300 Jimmy stole 300 The two drivers, we don't know how much, quite surely how much they stole, but they're in there pretty heavy. And that's why your food cost is off a huge amount. So we ended up, uh, you know, getting rid of all those bad apples. And Linda was at a $28,000 a year loss when I walked in. Within 12 months, she was plus 75000 So she made up the twenty-eight, and then she went seventy-five higher, and now she's very successful. But she has some strong, she's, she's, she's not naive anymore, and we have really, really tight money control control situations there. And we spot check. Yeah. How, do they, uh, <coughs> How are they doing it? Yeah. I'll teach you in a few minutes Hopefully here. We're, at, we're just getting me right. fired up here. Right. Uh, Joe actually knew the combination of her safe and the combination to her Ford Explorer within two days, too. <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah, I, I can open your safe. She says, no way. <laughs> safe says right there under the counter. You know, one of those, you know, the big ones? Yeah, it's, you know, 75, 15, 45, 5. You know that says, I got I got a good eyeballs, and you don't crowd in front of it when you do it. And if I can do it, any one of these people can do it. Scary. So we ask. We ask ourselves, why does my remote thing want to give me a hassle? Yeah, it was working great an hour ago, guys. I guarantee you. Ha, doggy. Here we go. <clears throat> We're hot. <clears throat> National Cash Register, Dayton, Ohio, started this, started this all with cash registers. Before cash registers, it was just money drawers and money boxes. <coughs> they did a study in, 19, in 1933 during the Depression, and their study showed that 25% of all your employees in the blue will never steal from you. They're morally against it. They just won't. In the red, the equal number of people working for you right now at this very minute are uh, rip-offs. They'll take anything that's not nailed down, and things come up missing all the time, and that's that's 25 percent because they're they're different. The 50 percent uh, will occasionally steal if the chances of being caught and prosecuted are slim to none. So what I'm going to talk about is that 50 percent. We're also going to talk about the people in the red, the, the kleptomaniacs <coughs> that'll take anything and not have a conscience, but the 50% are the ones that we can influence very easily and very quickly. This is why I think they steal. 
I think uh, those people in the red are kleptomaniacs and they have uh, a psychological disorder. We've all known people like that that just steal for the thrill of stealing. They just love, you know, to, to shoplift. You lay something down and you turn it on, it's gone, you probably think you know who took it. You know, you ever get a guy like that that you hang with every once in a while? Makes you crazy. I think most of all, a lot of the times our employees think that we're rich. And uh, they're not. And that's how I felt when I was 17 years old, you know. Whew, this guy's got all the bucks and here I am doing all the work. So they think we're rich. I think a lot of times they have a big need for money. A lot of my employees live uh, paycheck to paycheck. And if you've ever given payroll advances, you know that they're always struggling uh, three, four days before the paychecks come out. So they have a need for money. Or they live just a hair over their, their income levels. Next reason is it's very easy to steal. It's very, very easy to steal from a pizzeria. In fact, I would honestly tell any one of you in the room, if you would hire me in for seven days, I'll pay you 300 bucks. Cash, before I start. And in seven days, I'm going to figure out your system, and I'm going to get back my money. Unless you're really good, and that's what we want to get you before you leave the room today. And the last one is the chance of getting caught and prosecuted as a slip. We've all had situations where we let people go, but we didn't have enough evidence to prosecute them, right? We were just glad to see them go because we knew they were ripping us off. So they know that. So they'll steal, steal, steal until they get caught. And you just say, get the hell out of here. And they leave. And what happens? The guy with the $10,000 in his, in his visor, gone. You don't get your money back. That's just a call. You know, he can go find a job somewhere else if people are, are sloppy on, on job referrals and, and references, right? In fact, today I'm sure he's working and stealing for somebody else. No doubt in my mind. But that's another reason the chances of being caught and punished are slim. The National Restaurant Association says that $9 billion a year is stolen from restaurants, and 30% of all business failures are attributed to internal theft. That's a lot of money. They have, uh, they have a bunch of CPAs in Washington, D.C. that compile all these P&L statements, you know what I mean? And they do national surveys and studies on fine dining and on quick service and on pizzerias. And after they do a sting like they did at the Miami airport two or three years ago where they caught people stealing $3 million, $10,000 a day out of the Miami airport food service division, and they arrested them and they made it on the national news, they get those little numbers like that and they kind of extrapolate it. Their best guess is $9, million, $9 billion a year, which is a huge amount. We always think when employees are stealing, they're taking our cash, but I think there's other things that they take too. They can take food. And it's not so prevalent in pizzerias because it's very hard to deal with a 25-pound box of pepperoni, right? In a full-service restaurant, they got cases of bacon, cases of ham, cases of steak. they got seafood. They've got real grocery items that they can convert to home use. But it's pretty hard to do it. I've never had anybody steal, you know, to my knowledge, a lot of mozzarella, unless they tried to fence it to another pizzeria. But... This is a food we use just doesn't generally go home for personal use. They will take paper towels, soap, and anything else that they can use. I mean, I went and had a meeting with one of my employees at his apartment. and went to his bathroom, and huh, boy, that toilet paper looked awful familiar. You know what I mean? Real familiar. And there was uh, 200 rolls underneath this cabinet. I'm going, damn. All you got to do is ask. I'll give it to you, you know, or I'll make you a deal. But, man, I hate it when they steal. I think they take inventory, and that's, that's cooked food. Uh... I think they also steal occasionally trade secrets. See, these are your possessions. You own your recipes. And who you give them to and how you give them to them determines whether or not they come back to you compete against them. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to compete against my product right across the street. I don't mind if a guy works for me and learns and leaves and goes away. And that's how most of us started. We paid our dues, we learned, and we went away and we we learned through the College of Hard Knocks how to run a successful place. I don't have a problem, but when they got my stuff and they go right across the street and compete, then I got a problem with that. So we'll be talking about some confidentiality agreements and proprietary information agreements. I have them on Word documents, and if you want to just, you know, check them out, be happy to help you check them out. I think employees steal personal possessions sometimes. You think? 
That just makes me nuts. The girls leave their purses under the counter, and pretty soon somebody's, something's gone. That makes me nuts. And we're looking at that 25%, those people in the red. You know, the people in the blue and the people in the, in the gray, they're not going to rip off somebody's stuff. But those, those other people, we don't know who they are right now, but, boy, they're good at it, too. I think they take our equipment and supplies. I've got some pretty cool digital electronic scales for what I do. Portion control studies. The dopers love those things. They're down to tenths of a gram. You know what I mean? I've got to lock those suckers up, you know? <laughs> Just a two... A two-pound dial scale might come up missing because somebody had to do a weed job, you know, and Dave's got a scale. Man, you know? <coughs> they have no problem with stealing that stuff. And then supplies, like how many times you ever go to the first day cabinet and all the Band-Aids are gone? I mean, you bought a box of 100 two weeks ago and there's nobody wearing any, and somebody ripped off all the uh, good aspirin and the Band-Aids are all gone because they got a hangover, you know? That's just little trivial stuff that adds up into big bucks. But uh, that's, I think that's what they take. And how, we're going to ask ourselves how they do it with cash. The most famous way of doing it is just simply uh, faking out a ring up on a POS system or on a, on a cash register and have that person pay. And the money goes in the drawer. And then the person who did the, uh, the fake ring up comes back and takes the money out of the drawer when nobody's looking. That's the biggest way to do it. That's how Joe stole his 300 bucks. He did a combination at the counter and combination on delivery. That's how I'll steal my 300 bucks from you when I come. I'm going to figure out your system, and I'm going to do no sales or voids or manager whatever overrides and so forth, and I'm going to, and I'm going to have you almost authorize me to steal. I think our drivers under under uh, report delivery sales occasionally. Uh, you guys all on? Raise your hand if you're on a good POS system. And raise your hand if you're on paper slips. Now, when I, when I was on those funky ones, like I told you about Bill taking me to three copies with the permanent, that's so easy to steal. What I did is I upgraded to the next system, which would be made by, uh, I don't know, it's called Fast Food Forms or something like that. They have standard, standard register has those 10 on a page, things made just for pizzerias with the adhesive that goes sticks on your box. The old domino system, remember those? And that's what I went. Immediately when I got my bill story out of the way, I, I, I found these forms, and they're much better because you can't take the whole page out. The whole page is so e it's easy to steal a book. It's hard to, to unfold a page out of your back pocket. But then we had, we had a much better audit trail on those. And then after a period of two or three years, then we upgraded to POS systems, and POS systems are still not fail, fail safe because what we do is we allow people to share passwords. I have about three or four favorites. Go ahead. Okay. You don't see no numbers. Good. Everybody just, uh, they swipe it and away they go. That's even better because once you know each other's passwords, it's easy to, it's easy to assign deliveries to your buddy and uh, have the buddy fight it out with the boss after the shift's over. Right? I swear I didn't take it. Huh? Honestly, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a way to get around that is to do a customer survey call the next day. Because, you know, it's too, too late to call them at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> they could be in bed or whatever. But if you have that orphan delivery out there that two people are saying, we didn't take it, you can always call that customer back tomorrow night around 5.30 and inquire on, on their satisfaction level on product and service and quality. And by the way, was that driver... The little short guy with the long ponytail, or was it the old balding guy? Oh, that was a ponytail guy. I remember him real well. He's a cool driver. Yeah, <laughs> you took it. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens then is I go to you and says, you know, I have, you took that pizza to Mr. Negro. I called him today, and, you know, you probably forgot about it, and that happens, you know. It errors human, but to forgive, 200%. Yesterday it was 16 bucks. Today it's 32, or you're out of here. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I used to penalize my drivers, 100% penalty and interest one time when they, oops, had a brain. Well, you know what I'm thinking, right? And after that, we just couldn't trust them anymore. You had a question back here? I did. Yes. Uh, roughly. Yeah. For a pizza operation, what are one of these POSs going to cost? 
Well, the, the, the low-end POS systems, and I'm not saying low production, low quality, the lowest end that I like would be point of, sale success, uh, point of success, and that's a $600 software situation. You buy your own hardware printers and cash drawers. But it takes a level of expertise to be able to install all this because you don't have an installer coming in and spending three or four days for this in training. But for, you know, you go to www Dell and get your, your server and your, 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 your touch screens coming in, they have a pretty strong, stable system. On the other end of the scale where the, where the, where the high ends are going, uh, you can spend twelve to fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen is about average, yeah. My store, my store was twenty-three thousand. Sure, you don't have any, any of this. Yes. Uh, there's a pretty good chance if you're making it easy for them. Yeah. There's a pretty good chance in a ten thousand dollar a week store you're losing at least three hundred dollars a week. Right? Without question. Without question. Well, just an airs and just just airs in addition is good for a hundred a week. You ever go through your guest checks and re-add them and say, how come they undercharge that customer two bucks? I've never had a guy overcharge a customer two bucks. Have you? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> You've you got to write payroll, though, so you're a little more motivated to go that extra buck, right? But, yeah, on the POS systems, you know, if I, if I would have had one way back when, I would have had, had a lot less theft. They, you know, the combination of the marketing you can do with them, because you need to know who your customers are when you do have POS system. Right now, you currently don't know who your customers are, or there's no way you can track them easily. And the theft and the cash controls and reports, uh, I would definitely, I would upgrade to a POS system. And I'll talk privately about that on which systems are, 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 are solid, but uh, they will pay for themselves. They will pay for themselves quickly. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to lease that sucker for a couple hundred bucks a month. So if it saves you three or four or five hundred dollars a month and your lease payments two fifty or three, it's a money you know it, it is an investment instead of a liability. <coughs> and if it can't save you ten bucks a day, and I know it will, then you know, don't go there. I think under ring orders and pocket the cash. We already talked about the fake the fake ring up. <coughs> have you ever uh, have you ever seen in your cash register drawers when the drawer opens up you got pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters? And then a couple of 50 cent pieces, but rarely, right? And then you got your ones, fives, tens, and twenties, and checks go under the drawer, the checks go way back here. Have you ever seen orphan money flying in the drawer sometimes? Maybe a dime and a nickel and a quarter over in the, where it shouldn't be? Well, those are counters. Those are counters. If I'm a running your register and I'm doing a lunch business real quick, and that's six fifty for that, that sandwich and salad, or sandwich and pop. And 656, 56, 50, I ring up two, and I forget to ring up the third one because everybody's busy. Just taking the money, put it in the drawer. I'll put a, a nickel and a penny way over in the left-hand drawer slot. And then I have a $14 pizza, and I'm ringing people up in a hurry, and I, and I do the soupy shuffle on you. I'll put a dime and a nickel, and I'll take a penny out. And over in that left-hand drawer slot with all those little counters, that's how much money the register owes me before D Dave does a 4 o'clock... <laughs> Uh, countdown in the drawer. That's my dollar counter. And I'll wait till everybody's busy and everybody's gone. And I'll, I'll get the drawer open. I'll take my 28 bucks out, get rid of the counters. So when you come to count the drawer, it's balances. Those are counters. It may not be pennies, nickels, and dimes. It might be weird stuff. Huh? Anything like that. Straws, yeah. Uh, anything that's out of the ordinary around that register is a, generally a counter, yeah. Uh, how do cameras, camera, camera security systems work? work something like that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that real soon. But I was a real uh, strong hater of surveillance systems because I thought it was kind of an invasion of privacy and all that kind of stuff, you know, and it's like Big Brother looking at you. And after about a dozen horror stories like Linda and Traverse City, personally myself, and then dozens more, I'm an advocate of them. And now the price has come down where you can you can afford to put them in yourself for a grand, grand and a half. Monitor, monitor home? Yeah. In the high tech ones, you can just, you know, this is down feed, right? You know, it's like, you know, it's just a webcam. You can check it out at home. And especially if you're in a, in a crime situation, because when you install them, your, your help's going to say, well, man, Dave is spying on me, or Dave's looking out <coughs> for me because we have a crazy person coming here. It's just like you've all seen America Most Wanted, where they have the guy on videotape walking in, right? Like a bank. So this is for your protection to make sure if we have any violent crime, we catch the perpetrator. It's not to 
eyeball you guys. Sure. Uh, with this counting, when you have a, an employee that's counting, yeah. okay, would you agree that by far the, the person who can steal from you the easiest mm -hmm. is basically the one you trust the most? The guy who's count, that you allow to count money mm -hmm. out of your drawer, he's banning hundreds. Mm -hmm. He's been, he's, it is the norm for him to be handling money in your register. Exactly. Probably going to be the most likely. Right, and he's under least suspicion. Yeah, he has no control. I'll tell you a story about Las Vegas. You already know about Las Vegas because you watch the Discovery Channel like me. Buzzy Siegel, the Mafia, we're going to do Vegas. Right? Now look at it today. But guess who counts the money in Vegas? Little known trivia fact. Mormons. The second biggest Mormon temple in the United States outside of Salt Lake City is in Las Vegas. Almost every money counter surveillance guy working upstairs is a elder in the Mormon church. Because the Italians know they can't trust each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended anybody, but Vinny's going to get Lou, he's going to get Frankie, right? So anyway, that's, there's a higher calling here. They, they follow, probably fall over to the 25% to the left instead of to the right, you know? So you're exactly right. You know, the person you trust the most is probably the person who has the least amount of scrutiny. So you've got to double check those people all the time. Did you ever have your change bank come up, miss, short of a few bucks? Oh, man, is that, why? If we have this box and it's got ones, fives, tens, and quarters in there and all that stuff, why does it ever come up 20 and 40 and 50 bucks short? They, you know, when we hired these people in, they didn't have stupid tattooed on their forehead. Can't hire you, you're Forrest Gump, you know? No, they were smart, you know? We, we tried to hire up, but then all of a sudden, the cash drawer comes up 40 bucks short, two 20s. It's convenient, it's easy, we're never going to touch it because, you know why? There's nobody owns that cash drawer. It's there for on a Friday night to dive in and grab it and go and get it back and register. And I'm just talking about setting up some accountabilities. Did you ever have the bank call you at 8.30 in the morning after they've counted out your night deposit and call you up at home and say you're 50 bucks short on your deposit? How can that be? I have. Anybody else? Short on your night deposit? <coughs> 100 bucks? 50? It's never two. It's a nice round number, isn't it? So you drag your tired butt into the bank and they show you everything. They count it out. They do two <coughs> tapes on the register, on the checks and credit cards and... <coughs> Somebody, somebody slammed that thing, or they weren't thinking. Anybody ever got broken into besides me? Yeah. George, isn't it funny how they find the money? You can, you can hide it anywhere in, in that whole building, and they're going to find it. Am I right? They didn't ransack and toss your whole place. They went right to the cash, grabbed it, and split, right? Boy, is that ever cool. <laughs> huh? Took your whole register? Oh. And I always find that... Normally, when we, we do a, a, a stakeout at a restaurant, there's always possibly collusion going on with a manager and a manager working with a pizza man or a phone person working with a senior employee. There's generally two involved. We're going to take 100 bucks and we're going to split it 50-50. So if you get one, you can generally plan on getting two. Rarely is it just a one-person operation. Occasionally it is, but more often than not, it's collusion. Let's talk about taking from uh, the change bank, petty cash. How do you guys deal with your petty cash? I'll take some suggestions. Anybody raise their hand? You all got a cash bank there for? I just I <coughs> give them a zipper bag with a key. And okay. Three hundred dollars in there, and it's kind of they're in control of it. It's not it doesn't lay around so per se. You know, lots of times they do leave it laying around. Okay. So take it home with you, you know, and they just leave it laying around. Like the point is, they don't. But I just had a, a, a thought just a minute ago when you're talking about it. Thing I'm trying to set up some kind of document when you hire them. You kind of say, "All right, I'm fronting you this. This is this is your last paycheck when you leave. So it's really your money. And then at the end of the term, whenever they leave, until they come up with the money, they get their last paycheck." Oh, you must be reading my handouts. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> it just came to me. Yeah. <laughs> you see, normally a lot of times we don't have ownership on those cash register drawers, and we don't have ownership on that petty cash. And when we create ownership like Sears, Walmart, the banks, 
You go to your local bank and that lady has her cash drawer, she owns that. That was counted out when she started at her shift and when she's done, she counts it out and they, they've got a balance. They have to balance within 25 cents every day they work. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever have any people jump drawers whenever you're jamming? And get very, very seldom, which right. Don't that's that's a nice start. I I POS had a allows you to do it. yeah. The POS will allow you to do it. Well, no, well, the POS what a management. Allows you to have that control. Sure. Within, within exactly. 30, 20 seconds, you're you're doing sales for the whole thing. Well, we had a rule where I had uh, I had before I had POS I had cash registers and before that we had you know an old funky cash register with Thanks. only a few of us can remember these type of registers but I had one cha ching. And we had a rule where if it was your drawer, I couldn't go in it. I could come to you and say, would you break that 20 for me because I'm a driver, but I could never touch your drawer. And they hate that. And they hate that. But you know, if you started with 100 in that drawer and you did 1,000 in sales, there better be 1,100 bucks in the drawer or else we have, a, we have an auto trail right to this person. But whenever two or more people are in a drawer, you, you've, lose, you've lost control and he's going to deny it and you're going to deny it and you don't know who did it. So you've got to get assigned drawers to people. And I, I would never break an assigned drawer, even though I had the management code. I could override you and go in your drawer. I would never do it because I'm not, a, I'm not the sharpest pencil in a box, and I can make a, you know, and you're probably better at doing cash than I am because you do it every day and I do it once a week. So I just had a no busting into drawer rule. If you were in the bathroom, tough. Question? Do you have any bank or do you cash them up whenever? Well, that's, well, my, they carried their own bank. And uh, there's two ways to think about that, and I'm thinking, the other way is better. You got a question back here? <coughs> I was just going to say, they now have with those POS, they now have something where you can do fingerprint. The fingerprint thing, yeah, the ID recognition there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and there's no swapping, the right, there's no swapping uh, passwords, you know, because everybody knows my password. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. You said it all. Okay. So we've got uh, some cash stuff going on. And I think we have some areas of prepared food theft. Uh, we always, we, we did a lot of swapping food with other restaurants. No, it wasn't wholesale. Maybe once a week, we'd swap with Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. And we would do an equal swap. We'll give you two large pizzas. For your crew, you give us a couple buckets of chicken. Everybody's happy. Because my people get burned out on eating pizza. Their people get burned out eating chicken. Everybody's happy because it's an equal thing. And since I'm going to buy my employee meals anyway, the food cost equals out the food cost. They're still happy kids. I think the unauthorized meals are the ones that gets into our shorts because they'll come in and they'll just discount their friends, family, and locker partners and all that stuff without us knowing it or without our permission. So it's an unauthorized discount. And if it, isn't it amazing to see how many pizzas are kind of sitting on top of the oven at closing time? Mm -hmm. no, we never, never have mistakes until about 1030. And the reason is because they're going to take those home and eat them. Right? You're not going to let us sit up there and rot all night. You're going to say, okay, go ahead and take it off. Yeah, hmm? I didn't hear you. Throw them away. Throw them away? I give them to the cops. Well, oh, yeah, that's good. anybody that comes in, if there's a good customer that's fresh. Give me five bucks. Right. No, yeah, give just give it to them. I tell them you're the lucky person that came in. Good. You're the lucky number. Yeah. Uh, meals. Do you charge for meals? Or well, I found I did it both ways. You know, after 25, 30 years, you finally, you never really get it right. But I figured... <coughs> Uh, when I started making pizzas, I could eat anything I wanted within control after I'd worked for two or three hours. Because I came out, you know, I was a high school kid. Come in there and open up that store at 3.30, 4 o'clock. By 6.30, I'm starving to death. And my boss would let me eat, you know, make a personal pizza for the, you know, make a, a crew pie, we called it. So we made a crew pie or we made something and we set it on the, you know, break table and we all munched during shift. And I'm figuring, okay, now I've hit the big league. I've got 25 employees, and they're just guzzling, and they're eating like hogs. I'm going to charge them a dollar or two bucks or a portion thereof for their food. And I found that they would steal the food. I'd walk into the cooler, and somebody's eating a handful of ham. Because they're hungry. Hungry. And they don't have two bucks or three, four bucks. So to keep them all honest, we decided that we were going to offer free food after you've been there a couple hours, you know what I mean, and it, but it would be up to the manager's discretion, whatever the manager decided well, the crew's going to eat that night, and not, you know, we don't want to see the filet mignon going out to the employees, you know, so he would make, you know, we would just do a, a low-cost employee food, and we kept happier, higher morale people that way, and I didn't have them eating 
food and they walk in because they're just starved to death and they get the shakes. We also had a rule on uh, guzzling soda. If you're doing cans and bottles, that's real expensive. If you're doing syrup, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, but a lot of people aren't set up for syrup, but we eventually kicked 100% over to syrup because on cans and bottles, a person will pop a can or a bottle and take six or seven swigs, set it down, it gets warm, and that's going in the garbage can. I don't mind if they drink a little bit. They've got to stay hydrated, especially in a hot kitchen. But I do hate all that waste, and it's very expensive at 30, 35 cents or 40 cents a pop for a unit that they only get four or five swigs out of. So we had a... We had their own personal mug, and they hung on their own mug rack in the back room with your name on it, with a lid on it to make the health department happy, and they could just suck on, uh, on a fountain pop. And then I think people occasionally will mess up orders. They'll intentionally screw an order up. That, that small percentage will to make sure that they got an extra, make, uh, an extra pie so they can have a remake and deal with that extra pie because somebody they know is coming in a few minutes. That occasionally happens. So monitor your screw-ups. You know, one person shouldn't be having all the screw-ups. I screw up, you screw up, we all screw up. But when the same person does it continuously, that makes me a little bit suspicious. Inventory uh, theft would be taking food for resale to others. And in my 30-year career, I had a couple stupid people come in to me and say, I've got 20 cases of mushrooms for sale for five bucks a case. Or I've got 50 pounds of pepperoni for a buck a pound. Where the hell do they get that? Where do they get that? Where they got that is probably your place or my place. And they're taking her down the road 20 miles and see if they can dump it for cash. It doesn't happen a lot in pizzerias because, like I said, we use those top 10 items. They're pretty hard to <coughs> convert and fence for money. But if you ever have anybody coming in your store with a deal that's too good to be true, be suspicious and get their license plate number and maybe buy it with recorded bills and then call the cops because there's got to be a story behind where they come across these <coughs> 10 cases of mushrooms or these five cases of pizza sauce or this 50 pounds of pepperoni. There's a story there and I'll bet you you'll be doing a buddy a favor in the next town over. So group together and just say I will not buy any hot food. It's not worth it. Don't do it. <coughs> Taking food for personal consumption, that happens. <coughs> a lot of hams go zinging away around Easter time. You can just order extra ham. You know, somebody's going to nail one or two of them, you know, or they're going to do a deal at closing time, chunka chunka. And then the biggest one, the biggest theft thing I think uh, that makes me crazy is when they don't rotate their food very well. And that's truly theft. And if you own the job of unloading the truck and putting the food away in the cooler and that food isn't pulled and rotated and dated, whether you know it or not, you're stealing from the whole crew and from me when we have to throw food in the dumpster. Would you agree on that? But these kids don't get that, do they? To them, it's just crap, right? We never run out of it. We've always got lots of food, but they never write the check for it, so they don't realize how costly that is. I'll never forget a real uh, life story I came off a consulting job, I don't know, Thursday afternoon. I went into my store. I sat down with a cup of coffee with my manager, and we're debriefing over what happened last week while I was gone to some place. And I said, what's happening that I, you know, anything extraordinary happening? <coughs> and that's Joe, Italian. He says, yeah, got a big problem. I've got to come in here 30 minutes early every day, and I've got to go through the cooler. Me, personally, I've got to come in early because Doug Kaiser, the guy who owns the inventory rotation is not doing his job. He's in love. He's on drugs. Something's happening because he's not going in there and pulling that food and rotating it and dating it. And I'm throwing away 20 to $30 worth a day of food. And it's pissing me off because that comes out of my bonus. And I've sweet-talked Doug. I've threatened Doug. I've come to almost, and there's nothing working, man. So every day I've got to come in early and I'm throwing away fresh produce. I'm throwing away rotten hamburger. You know, it's all getting bloody. And, and the kid's just not doing it, Dave, and it's making me crazy. I said, well, you want me to hop in here on this one? He said, oh, yeah, because I'm ready to pop them, man. I don't want that, because Joe would. <laughs> so I brought Doug off to the side. You know, and I don't know, he's only about an 18, 19-year-old kid, but he's a great employee. And he owns this job because he can do it. He's smart. He orders all the food. He rotates it. 
I'd pay him 20 bucks a week to do the job. And you should do that too. You all place your own orders? How boring is that? How boring is placing the order? Because you're never ready. He calls you and you're always going, oh, call me back in a half an hour. Yeah, man, I'm busy. So what if you give it to an 18, 19 year old superstar and you set him up with the three ring binder because you and the salesperson are going to talk price, right? But the kid, all he's got to do is count. If we have to have 20 bags of flour in stock and we have 11, I order how many? Nine. Pretty easy work, right? So when the sales rep calls, got you ready for their order? Done. And you give them 20 bucks a week. Comes in on Tuesday for Thursday, Sunday for Tuesday. You're staying home with the family. Let that kid go in there and shake, rattle, and roll those boxes, because it's boring. Besides, this kid's going to do a better job than you do. He's going to count the rolls of toilet paper. You're going to go, yep. <laughs> he's going he's to count them. And then, so anyway, Doug Kaiser was my guy. I got Doug Kaiser off the side. I said, come here, Doug. How's it going this week? He said, oh, it's going really good, man. I said, hey, you know, the pharmacy called. I got to run down and get a prescription for my wife, and I left my wallet at home. Would you loan me 20 bucks? Because I don't go in the register. We already established that, right? I can't go take a pay paid out. So sure, man. He came out of his wallet, you know, and he popped that baby, and he gave me a 20, and I said, come here. And I took him over to the spaghetti pot, and I moved the spaghetti pot over, and I put his 20 right in the fire. And he's looking at that money, and he's looking at me, and you see his lips moving. And you know what he's thinking, right? What the hell are you doing? Right? I says, Doug, I says, every day you forget to come in here and do a great rotation on the food. That's how much money I throw in the dumpster every day. And I just thought I'd let you feel the pain because I'm not paying you back. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and I walked away. And this kid was like speechless. His veins were starting to stick up. Why? Because he's feeling the pain, right? And I didn't know if he was going to jump me from behind or not. I really didn't know. But I was kind of walking like this, you know? <laughs> An hour later, Doug had Andy and Craig back there burning them for 10 apiece. <laughs> yeah, because those are the guys that are really the perps. They told me they were doing their job right. So he burns them for 10 apiece, and he gives them the same line I gave him. He says, hey, Red Dave burned me for 20. I'm burning you for 10, because you guys are supposed to be on that walk, and you're not on it. You're me look bad. I'll see you tomorrow. By 4 o'clock, they had some poor dumb driver back there, and they're burning him for five because he's not doing the flour and pizza boxes right. <laughs> My rotation problem went away immediately because now they're feeling the pain like we do, but we don't broadcast it very well. <coughs> now, I got to tell you, Mom called me at 8.30 at night, all pissed off because I'm breaking 25 or 35 federal laws by burning currency, and she told me so. And I told her, hey, you know, you're absolutely right. And my intention wasn't to burn your kid for five or 10 or 20 bucks. My intention was to plant a seed that he's going to think, and I'm going to give him back his money in time. I'm not going to personally hurt him for that money because he works hard for it. But he had to feel it today and tomorrow and the next day. And when I give him back to him, things will be, he will be a changed person. By the way, can I help you have him stop ruining things around your house? Because he's the one who leaves the bike out in the rain. He's the one who... You know, kids are like that. They don't, they're, not taught, they're not taught that take care of it, take care of it, because it's a lot of money stuff. Not like we were anyway, I don't think. Poor rotation. Problems go away. Burn a 20 once, you'll be legendary. A year later, people are talking about it. You know, when you go in here and you see something that's not rotated, you better do it or Dave's going to get your butt for a 20. Really? Yeah, I remember the day he burned a 20. Oh, so the, it passes amongst the employees. Becomes to be a you know, point of... A point of talk. Recipes to competitors, I think, is a trade secret theft. Recipes for future personal competition, I think, is a, is a theft. Divulging sensitive data to people who don't need to know is theft. And mailing lists. On your P&L statement, it has a thing called the balance sheet with assets and liabilities. Your assets are all the hard stuff you own, right? And whether they're completely paid for, you're still paying the bank. But you got your mixer, your oven, your walk-in, all your equipment. 
you can throw them right in the dumps because the most important asset that you own is your mailing list. And you control that mailing list. And how would you like that mailing list to get in your competitor's hands? How would you like me, if I was your competitor, to have every customer's, your customer's name, address, phone number, how many times they ordered, and what they ordered, and what they liked the most? Would you like me to have that information? I'm your competitor. I'm right across the street. Oh, hell no, right? Because what am I going to do with that information if I'm a competitor of yours, George? I'm going to mail those people. Unbelievable, if for free, right? I'm going to make them a deal where they can't, they're going to come try me. Because all I really want them to do is try our two pizzas. And I'm going to love you. And I'm going to make a great pizza. And maybe you'll quit going to him, come to me. That's what I'm going to do with that list. What are you doing to protect your mailing list? Hmm? We burn ours. We leave them in the bag and we burn them. God bless you. My wife's hell on ours because we're stealing it far away. Many people don't. Me included for a while. Because when we went from the crummy little books, we upgraded those dominoes type sheets. And what we would do at the end of the night is we would reconcile all those master sheets to all our deliveries and carryouts. We'd roll them up in a rubber band and we'd slip a rubber band on them and write them May 1st, 2005. And we put them in a box in the office. And then after about two, three weeks, nobody called back. So, you know, that's our, that's our, check, you know, that's our check and balance thing in the box. We'd throw them in the dumpster. Because eventually your office gets, it starts to crowd you out. You know what I mean? You got stuff that's falling down off of shelves, and you got all these receipts that are hanging around forever. You just phew, dump them. Huh? I used to. Yeah. And then so did Domino's. <laughs> and Doug Kaiser was hungry for money. And, uh, Anything that hits the dumpster is abandoned property. Nobody has title to it. It's not theft. So once a night on the way home, real late, Doug Kaiser would look in the Domino's dumpster with his flashlight, and he, when he found the mother load, it took him about three weeks, I paid him big bucks to bring me the mother load, but Domino's, all Domino's customer database come to me. What if it's locked? Hmm? What if it's gated and locked? What if it's what, gated and locked? It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> it was right there. I don't know. If it's gated and locked, no it depends. Yeah, I'd, I'd hire one of their drivers to give it to me. You think I could go into any one of your stores and pay your trusted employee a thousand dollars to run me a backup copy of your mailing list on a CD for me? Hmm? Oh yeah. <laughs> depends how hungry they are, right? What if you know? Could we get it for five hundred bucks? Maybe. Wouldn't take long. Stick that CD in there. Password, mailing list, burned a CD, would it? Wouldn't take very long, would it? Or burned a floppy or burned a whatever. And then pretty soon, there you go. Choo, 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 choo. I got you now. If I own your mailing list, I'm going to hammer you with it. I'm going to beat you up with your own customer base, big time. So guard that. You know, we got it from Domino's. Well, thank goodness I, I got the epiphany and started burning mine like you did. They didn't stay in the building. We didn't throw them in the dumpster. They went home and they got personally shredded or burned right in my burn barrel out in the backyard, you know, because I don't want that falling into my, into my competition's hands. And when we went to POS, we had to, like, triple protect it so nobody could do our mailing list. Let me go back to the point of sales is you could give them, like your manager, a passcode only to do certain things. Yes. That's what's nice about we have that signature. Yeah. And she could only get in certain things. She can't burn nothing. Or right. Only my wife. Mm-hmm. That's all that really pays off. So the, the, the check and balances are there. We just have to make sure we use them. Go ahead, George. I just want to make a quick comment, uh -huh. um, just in case we're asked for cash. This only applies to those of you that uh, don't have POS. Um, if you're working out of an old register, make sure you, one of the things I did that was really helpful, how many notes you have, you'll find a certain community that will lock one note there. And that's it. You know, it's, you know, it's bring it in something other than, you know, don't be count change 17 times. Mm -hmm. I, so I got this little Caesars across the street. I got Domino's mailing list nailed, right? We got them. We're mailing it to them. I'm getting customers. And I really, really, really want little Caesars mailing list. 
I want it bad. I didn't tell you that I was a nasty marketer, did I? Oh, I wake up in the morning and I sharpen my knife and I want to go stick it in her heart and twist. I hate them. But I won't break the law, but I'll come close. But I want a Little Caesars mailing list. But Little Caesars at the time did not deliver. They only started delivering about six, seven years ago. It was only carry out only. Dine in, carry out, no delivery. They were the last of the big four to, to go into the delivery market. So I got this little Caesars who's giving away cheap pizza all the time. And it's just making me nuts because I hate their guts and they're making crummy pizza and they're bringing the whole industry down to where pizza's not ought to be. And I wanted their mailing list and I didn't know how to get it. Because they don't even have it. You see, when somebody calls Little Caesars and say, hey, I want to order that pizza pizza for Jim. Okay, Jim, come on in about 20 minutes. We'll hit it ready for you. Jim showed up. Jim's got the pizza. You know, they ring him up. They don't know where Jim lives. They, don't know, they might know his phone number, but that doesn't do me much good. I want to know his address. So I did things like follow Jim home. That's kind of funky, following people home and writing down their address. You know, that's cheap, right? Then I went to my buddy, Sergeant Al McGregor, Oscoda Police Department, my old buddy. I said, Al, if I give you a little list of license plate numbers every night, would you run them through the central dispatch and get me addresses? Never know unless you ask, right? And he says, man, I can't do that because <laughs> they'll catch on and I'll lose a stripe because we can only do that on, 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 you know, on legal traffic stops when we got to know their name address, you know, <laughs> running through the lay machine. They'll catch on. I said, well, I thought I'd ask. So I'm kind of stumped. I really want their mailing list, but they don't even have it to give me. So I'm, what am I going to do? Huh? What, what would you do? Give it up, right? Get a job. Now, I went over to Kentucky Fried and I bought a couple chicken buckets, empty. You know, the big old buckets? Wrapped my gold tin foil around them. And cut a little slot in the top and got registered to win. And I went over to my buddy across the street at the Sitco gas station, Danny Gary. <laughs> He's a firefighter just like me. We've known each other 20 years. He says, Danny, I want to buy 20 oil changes. Cool. Are you going to give them to your driver? He says, no. How much? He says, I don't know, 15 bucks a piece. So I wrote him a check for 300 bucks. He said, write out 20 oil changes. Good to the bearer of one free oil change, lube oil and filter. He says, thanks, Dave. He says, no problem. He says, but I want you to take those across the street to Little Caesars. You want me to what? He said, I want you to take this chicken bucket across the street to Little Caesars with register to win for a free oil change, courtesy of Gary Oil Company, and have people fill out these little slips while they're waiting for their pizza. No, I'm bad. And we did. He had to be a little, he had to be coached. I had to remind him I saved his life once, you know, things like that. <laughs> so he went over there and he said, Danny, yeah, you went to the basement. I came down and got you and got you out of there, you know, you, you owe me. So Danny went over there and he gave five to the owner and says, every Friday, if you like, we can give away two oil changes to your customers for the next couple of weeks. What do you think? And the guy went, that's a pretty cool idea. So we had a big old stack of these registered wins and people are waiting there. Jim Jones, 123 Main Street, I go to Michigan, phone number, dropping them, dropping them, dropping them, dropping them, dropping them, dropping them. And every Friday, Danny would go in here, grab the full one, put down an empty one, and he'd bring me the full one. Now, am I proud of this? Yeah. <coughs> we had their whole mailing list in about a month. Cost me 300 bucks for oil changes. And now Danny owes, I owe Danny big time, right? But once I've got your, your, your mailing list, I'm going to hammer you with it. We made the sweetest, most suck up a syrupy letter to those people and mailed them free pizza, free breadsticks to come in and try us in the next two weeks. And we wanted to break their habit, right? We wanted to break their habit of going there and, and have them come up the quality ladder once. So guard your stuff is what I'm saying. If it's not really guarded, think about how... It w what would happen if it fell in somebody else's hands? Tools, office supplies, smallwares, delivery bags. Y'all have delivery bags disappear every once in a while, like you had a pile that big and all of a sudden it's that big? Whew. Where do they go? Is there a special place for delivery bag heaven? Huh? You get 20 of them, all of a sudden you're down to 9 or 10. You say, okay, go to your cars and bring all the delivery bags back in here. and We're sick of this, you know? And all of a sudden a few more show up. And don't worry, you're not the only one. It keeps the delivery bag companies in business. But they go someplace. And I had uh, once in my store, I had a lot of GIs that worked for me because my store was right next to a big Air Force base. 
Wordsmith Air Force Base was here, Oscoda was here, the kids went to the same school system, it was only a two miles away. I delivered millions of dollars worth of pizzas to Wordsmith. And I had a GI working for me, who was a, del a delivery driver, and he, uh, he eventually, over a period of a month or two, accumulated about 20 delivery bags. One at a time in his trunk, you know what I mean? This took them. They're not missed, because we had a huge pile, now the pile shrinks and shrinks some more. But on a, and I, that's the last thing I inventory is, you know, my, my drivers, they always, you know, say we're getting low on bags. And, well, they didn't disappear, go get them, you know, and they, they always go out and scrounge them out. <coughs> well, this young guy, about 22 years old, married with a kid, a one-striper, maybe a two-striper airman, got these bags, and he drove to the next town down, about 20 miles away, and went into Mr. Mike's Pizza. And he went up to the counter, and he introduced himself to the manager, and said, my name is John Doe, and I've got 20 of these delivery bags. <coughs> you like them? And she says, yeah, they look pretty good. So I've got 20 of them. You can have them for five bucks a piece. Really? Yeah. <coughs> Don't ask, you know, she's, you know where, where'd you get them? Doesn't matter. 20 bucks, five bucks a piece. All of them <coughs> for 100 bucks. She says, give me a minute. I've got I to make a call and make sure I can do a cash paid out. So she went to the phone and she called who? Me. Because she used to work for me. Her name is Vicki Bryant. She was one of my managers who now works for Mr. Mike. She knew those bags. She was there the day we numbered them with the magic markers. So Dave, I got some fly rod in my dining room with 20 of your bags. What do you want me to do? I said, oh, no. That's, a, that's slang for Air Force guys, fly rods. I said, what's he look like? Driving a duster? Yeah, that's him. I said, oh, man. I said, well, buy the bags, Whip out, because I know Mr. Mike real well. You know, I sold my place to Mr. Mike, so I, I could tell Vicky what to do. Says, get, get 520s, write down the serial numbers of those 520s, pay him with the 520s, get a receipt, even though it's bogus, and then call the cops when he gets in the car. Okay, I'll do that. But she didn't have, she says, I don't have to call the cops. I said, how come? Because uh, undercover special agent, State Trooper John Pegg's in the dining room having lunch right now. I went, yes. So Sergeant John Pegg was there. Kid came in and brought all 20 bags in here, dumped them on the floor. Vicky gave him 100 bucks. He scratched out a bogus receipt. He took off for the front door. As soon as he stepped outside, John Pegg arrested him. And I got my bags. But, well, I got my bags back after two months because now it has to go through a chain of evidence. Whenever anything's stolen, the police own it for whatever until they, they want to give it back to you. But I had to make a real moral decision on what I want to do with this kid. And that's hard on us sometimes. Because how, how hard and how, how mean are we going to be to a 21-year-old guy with, married with a kid with one or two stripes because when I'm done with him, he's going to get court-martialed. He's going to go on his military record. He created a crime, a civilian crime. You know, they're going to spank him bad. And why did he steal? Was he one of those kleptos? I think not. I think he had a new baby. I think he needed pampers and baby food and formula, and I think he wasn't making enough money on a one strip or two-stripe paycheck. Tips weren't that good, and he figured, hey, Al, he ain't going to miss a bag or two or three. That's what I think. That's why I think he did it. He was basically a really nice person. And we've all, you know, the only difference between him and me is he got caught and I never did. So I call up the prosecutor, who I know, and I call up the base commander, who I know, and we just had lunch unofficially and decided we were going to give him a little spanking and then let it leave his record in a year if he stays really clean. So I got back my money. I got back the bags. He got a reprimand. The commander's call reprimand. It didn't go to a full-blown court-martial. He got a suspended 30-day 30 30 day jail sentence that would be expunged off his record in like 24 months if he never sinned again. So I think justice was, justice was done, and it didn't ruin his life. But it's hard making those calls because, you know, that's, we're afraid of doing that sometimes. When we have, like the guy who stole $10,000, Bill, that was a real easy decision. I want him to hurt because he's putting the hurt on me and all my crew. But this kid who was young and dumb, got caught ripping me off for 100 in product, so 
you know, be ready for that because you're going to have to make the decision how, how hard and how fast and how long do you want me to push this? Well, the, the cops will ask you that and then the prosecutor will. So have a policy. And if you have a policy, we will prosecute. You can't unprosecute one person and then prosecute the next. You got to do them all because that's discrimination. So that's my delivery bag story. You probably have stories like that too, but uh, we always we always numbered our bags and we, we put a uh, we always wrote our names on them with a permanent marker too. Made it and they always got back to us. Did you ever have somebody bring a delivery bag into you? They found on the side of the road. Isn't that cool? Because the drivers, you know, they throw the bags on top of their car when their arms are loaded up, and they drive off, and it flops in the ditch. And then one of your customers brings that bag back to you. We found this in the ditch by the real estate one office. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so get your yeah, put your real huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll let you guys decide your own notes on personal property and company property. And this is the way I found that we can catch them. I like to put extra money in the cash register drawer at opening. We always started with 100 bucks in our drawer. Two rolls of pennies, a roll of nickels, dimes, and quarters, and then we had, you know, so much in singles and one ones and fives. Occasionally, after that person signed for the drawer, and they had that drawer installed in there, I would put an extra 20 or 40 bucks in the drawer, somewhere midway through lunch. And when it's Z out time and then reconciliation time at 4 o'clock, because we, 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 we counted our drawers twice, once at 4 and once at closing, if that person did the Z out sheet and they, 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 they rebuilt the drawer to 100 and they had their money next over, they they're going to be 40 over, right? <coughs> what, if they're, what if they're not? Hmm? Okay. And I want them to tell me when they're over. I want them to tell me when they're under. And I don't want any, any hanky-panky. So if that drawer's over, I need to hear about it. So you can, if you want to test anybody for their honesty quotient, overload the drawer once or twice and see what, they, see what, see what happens when you count it down. Number two. Um, we'll get up to it. Limit who has access to the drawer. I know it used to be a free-for-all in my place. You know, everybody went in the till anytime they wanted to for any reason, and we all rank people up, and we're always losing money because we can't pin it on one or two people. So limited. I don't care if you have to buy one extra cash drawer. It's certainly going to pay for itself pretty quickly. Also, that petty cash box, somebody ought to own that. I mean, use, it's yours. It's 400 bucks in there. At 10 o'clock, there's 400 bucks in there. So if somebody needs change, you go see him. He's going to make the change, but he owns that box. Just don't go help yourself. Educate me a little bit. You said you have more than one drawer. Was it cash register with multiple drawers? Yeah. Or if you have POS systems, you can have like two or three different ter uh, computer terminals with one, two, or three different drawers. Okay. You know, and you only use one of those drawers on a slow night, but you can kick into two or kick into three active drawers on a busy night. Does that make sense? Yep. And you can get cash registers with two drawers, top one and a bottom one. That's uh, a lot of the big retail chains have two-drawer cash registers. You know, they have the top one that's constantly acting. They have the bottom one that if that person has to go on a break or something, somebody relief comes in and runs their line for an hour, they're, they own the bottom drawer. The top one won't open. Random and unexpected cash counts. You, we're pretty predictable people. What time do you break your drawers and count them? 4.30, 5 o'clock, and then it's closing, right? What if you were doing it at 1.15? Hmm? Not good. Why not? What if you were to do a Z-tape at 115, take the drawer out there, put the Z-tape in there, put a fresh drawer in there and close it and just go to the office and count it down? If you have a thief, they don't have time to get their counters straightened out, do they? They're going to probably be over if they're, if they're stealing and counting money with the counters, right? So we did random and unexpected <coughs> Z-outs and, 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 and cash counts. They had the cash and get them out from the draw. You actually had that? Yeah. So they could balance it from the draw. Oh, yeah. <coughs> uh-huh. You would Which doesn't have the amount. They take your draw, take it from draw. Take it. Yeah, it goes both ways. The POS systems, they, they, they state what they have, and then, the, then it's a secret on what they're supposed to have. But, yeah. but I would say that's a management function. The management ought to go in there unexpected, unannounced, uh, an hour or two before evening shift closed down, or an hour or two, <coughs> right at, half an hour after lunch is over, and do a random unexpected countdown to the drawer. 
And if you have anybody that's got sticky fingers, it's going to pop up right now. And if you only have one person on that till, it's going to pop up big time because it's impossible to have an over an over drawer. When's the last time you didn't give a customer enough change from their transaction? Tell me all the times. <coughs> Not very many, is there? I gave you 20. Oops, you're right. That happens so rarely. And the customers catch you every time when it's an accident because they know how much they gave you. If you get somebody that's constantly over, that's BS. They got counters going somewhere there, and they're just doing under rings, and they're going to steal the money out of there. Coins in the wrong places. Sign for cash drawers. Lock up petty cash and counted money. Two signatures on your night deposit slips. On your night deposit slip, it's going to the bank or whatever, you know, whatever. You, you do your, your coins, your cash, your checks, your credit card, your gross receipts, and the person who did the countdown signs it, and then a witness signs it. And then it goes zip in that zipper bag and either goes to the bank tonight with an escort or it goes hidden in your store for tomorrow morning. First thing, doesn't matter to me. But if that bag's ever short, it ain't going to be because we got two people that double, that double counted it. If one person did it, they're going to say, it was there when I zipped it. If two people do it, they're going to get on somebody else's case, right? Surveillance cameras, we talked about that. If I had to do it all over again, I would go to Sam's Club or Walmart, and I would invest for, you know, some surveillance cameras. In fact, I'd probably go all the way, and I'd have it so I could monitor them at home on my, on my laptop. The good systems now are internet web driven. And uh, you know, you can store a lot of camera on, on, a, on, a, on a one gig computer, slow-mo camera, you know. Also, it's an area where you can compliment your employees. I don't want this camera to be big. You know, I have a client in Charleston, West Virginia. If one of their employees blows their nose wrong, the guy's on the phone bitching at him. Well, that breaks their spirit. They hate the camera. And they'll find the place where the camera can't see, like around the corner by the dumpster, and they'll rah, 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 rah. But, you know, find a way with that camera where you can say, man, I see me, I took, you took really good care of Grandma, Grandma Caldwell. That was super good job, you know? And you pump your people up with the camera because we want to we catch them being as good as we can instead of as bad as we can. And they eventually forget about those cameras. I mean, I don't go to the bank and stare at the camera. You don't either. It's just, it's just known. You're on film. You know what I mean? And, uh, and after a while, it, your employees are going to know that it's on film. So, you, you know, let them know you're watching it by praising them on good things they do. Question? Oh, he's on the phone? Okay. Password protect your POS systems in degrees. You know, this is a need to know situation. Also, theft of proprietary information. If I'm doing a $5,000 Friday, ain't nobody needs to know but me and my manager. Really? Because that's going to spread around town. Kids don't keep secrets, you know what I mean? So there's a need to know situation on all that sensitive data. And we sometimes, you know, how much does your local Walmart do? It's none of your business, right? There's only two or three people that know, but it's not public. They don't put it in the paper. But all our employees talk. Especially after work when they're burning one out by the park. Huh? huh? Something going. These franchisees, I mean, each shift, and they, they actually keep a clipboard. Right there on the counter. Right, right yeah. there. You can get, I know. Can tell you how much a Dunkin' Donuts does by going to any store that's not a bad isn't, that's not, isn't that dumb? I never understand. I don't get it either. And I've seen that happen with Burger Kings and so forth. Where they have $1,900 breakfast, 2000 you know what I mean? It's right there. It's amazing. This is how to catch a thief delivery. We have zero tolerance on unpaid deliveries, and if I caught you by that, that survey thing, it was 100% penalty and interest one time. And then we, huh? I don't care. They want that job? I don't care. Yeah, but when you open up, yeah. you know, when you open up, up to enough, I mean. Yeah. Can you legally do it? I don't know. Well, you know, you only got to do it once because you're never going to do it twice. The guy's a dick and he can't get it right. He doesn't need to deliver pizzas. But I've had guys plunk down 32 instead of 16. Can you legally get... That scares me too because how much did they hit me for before that? Yeah, exactly. Coupon shuffle. You're doing coupons and all of a sudden you're selling lots of pizzas on this is your favorite, favorite coupon. And these drivers are coming in and they're attaching buck off two bucks to these slips and they want to be reimbursed. 
Because the customer, you know, we always have to quote our price on the phone before we hang up the phone, right? That's going to be eighteen dollars and fifty cents. We'll be out there in about forty minutes. Cool. Yeah. The driver gets there, and occasionally this happens. He presents the order, and the person gives him sixteen fifty plus a two dollar off coupon. The person never mentioned to us on the phone. Well, dri that happens. Doesn't happen all the time, though. A lot of times, drivers will clip your coupons, and they will just merge their coupons on any orders and want to get reimbursed for these twenty-five dollars worth of coupons. Right? It's a good plan. And a lot of times, the managers and the drivers are not in on it. If you've got a, a semi-disgruntled manager who's in on it, they'll they'll do the coupon shuffle all the time. Would you let them do that if they came in? The guy didn't tell you that he had a coupon on the phone. Now the driver gets there. Oh, here's my coupon. Mm -hmm. Would you let him come in with the coupon and the money? I make him call me from the front porch of the house. I can tell you, Papa Gino's doesn't. Mm -hmm. I forgot to. Oh, I have a coupon. Yeah, you went to the refrigerator. Can't, can't take it. Okay. No, you have to tell the. You, you, you have to tell them that time for it. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Smith. Uh, this is uh. Hey, Frank, I'm here at Mr. Smith's house. He just had a three-dollar coupon on me. Let me speak to him, Mr. Smith. Hey, that's okay. We'll take three dollars off. Thank you very much. I'd appro I'd approve that. I'd go in there. I'd find that and I'd edit that ticket and put the coupon on it. But that, as long as there's a check and balance, people won't be honking you. What about like a say you have a box topper? Uh huh. So, and your employees need to be putting them on the, on the box, and there's coupons associated with it. That box, the box toppers right there, they could scan a bunch of box toppers and go fill a car up, and then how do you get around that? Tell me. You're, you're the pizza pro. <laughs> Don't have the box toppers. No, box topper number. Yeah. You have a drive template. George? Yeah. Mention yeah. your coupon when ordered. That's it. Other, Don't take otherwise, it will not be honored. Yeah. So, so you do a little disclaimer there, right? Mention the coupon when ordering. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't be honored. Fair. I also have my, I think when they take the phone call, ask if this is going to be a coupon. See, I never do that because that really pisses yeah, off about yeah. half the people. No, how do I get one? Yeah. Yeah. Never had a, never had a problem. Oh, uh, but in their mind, they're thinking it. They might not be saying it, but don't you? Yeah. I go to Kentucky Fried Chicken once a week. Did I ever show you a picture of my family? I got four teenage boys. Okay. And I got a wife that's got a full-time job at the schools. You know my life. It's busy, busy, and once a week. We got to feed these kids. Somebody's got soccer practice. And, you know, we're going to do pizza once a week. We're going to do KFC once a week. Do you think I ever, ever have a coupon for KFC? No. And at home, I'm driving through. Wife calls me. What's for dinner? Damn, I don't know. Why don't you get a bucket of chicken? Okay. That happens every day. Or let's grab some pizza. Okay. I got to go back for a meeting. You know, that kind of stuff. I never have a coupon. And the day Kentucky Fried Chicken says, I'm going in there for this, you know, I want to get the $27 screw you meal. <sighs> they're, not, they're not easy, are they? Some funky mashed potatoes and gravy and some coleslaw and some bird for 27 bucks with a couple funky biscuits. I don't have that $5 coupon. And they never ask me because I'll say, no, but I'd sure love to have one. Am I the only guy in the last that pays retail for chicken? That's the way they feel. So I've done it both ways, and I, I think that we quote them the price, and that's the price that the driver will be collecting unless we get a phone call. Yeah, question? Back to coupons. Yeah. Uh, we have dine-in waitresses as well as delivery drivers. Okay. Box tops go out with a coupon on it. Uh-huh. We were getting excessive ones in the dining room. Uh-huh. Uh, and we were taking for at least 3000 Sure. And what was happening was the coupons were stored in the delivery area to go on the boxes when it's slow. Yep. And the waitress got a check, so they take the check from the table, flip the coupon in, bring it Oh, it's a great, great out. game. How do you prevent that? Because, I mean, you have to have these coupons out. They have to go on the box. <coughs> what? It's, I mean, we were just, we brought it to everyone's attention and mm -hmm. dropped like it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any Well, the first thing is it can't be for, for money. Well, I mean, couldn't you? Use box toppers should be for product and not for money. Couldn't you use a color code or number? Think about this it scenario. They have to get signed out signed we do buck, two buck, three buck off. off That's the ones they're going to grab to and gravitate to. The buck, two buck, three buck, right? Yeah. And they're going to attach those. What if they have uh, order a large pizza, get a free garden salad? Order a medium pizza, get a free order of breadsticks with sauce. 
That is useless to a server and to a driver. Right? Useless. Don't offer cash. Never offer cash. Cash is on the on, on, on the ones that are out of their, out of their touch control where they can't you know they can't control those and they're locked up in the building, but always do the the value added stuff on these things. Besides, people would rather get a three dollar or four dollar five dollar salad than two bucks off a pizza. And it's a whole lot cheaper to make a four dollar salad than it is give them two bucks cash. And when you're doing two bucks cash, you're degrading your price point. You yeah, make them pay full for the pieces and give them the add-ons. So you don't have to go into that. Plus you get them to taste other products. Yeah, that's right. And you know, if you eat my Caesar salad once, maybe you'll buy it the next time. If you eat my breadsticks, ooh. Ooh, if you never eat my breadsticks, you're never going to order them. It's not a coupon now. But it's a, it's a value-added thing, yeah. And they're useless to servers. Can't use them. <sighs> coupon shuffle. Call back customers. And that's the way, you know, I would... You know, that, that person in the dining room that comes up with a, with a $3 off thing, you know, just go right over to the table and survey those people. That'll tighten her bottom right up. Hi, my name's George. I'm the owner. How was your meal tonight? Yeah, and how was the service? And isn't, jo isn't Joyce a great server tonight? Jo what'd you have tonight? Well, you must have took advantage of that coupon. And they look at that like, what? And all of a sudden, Joyce is going, I'm dying. Well, I'm dying, right? You do that once or twice, have the cuts better go out there and just do it once or twice and survey and make them feel good. And that Joyce is going to spread the word. We can't be scamming on these things because he's going to catch you. There was a book written two and a half months ago by two Bourbon Street waiters called How to Burn the House Down by Chip Galenka and another guy. Go on the web and buy it. How to Burn the House Down. Do a Google search. It's a 100-page soft cover book. They sell it for $9.95 and it goes through 50 ways to steal from the boss from a restaurant. I'm going to write that book for delivery drivers. I'll be rich. <laughs> 50 ways, ways to steal from a pizzeria by Big Dave Ostin. Send me your $9.95 and I'll mail you one. Or do a free download. It's, you know, they really think that they're, in, they're entitled. They're empowered to make more than we pay them. And they know if they get caught, they're just going to get a little spank and they're going to move on to the next job. Why me? <laughs> oh, yeah, on food, food going off the dumpsters, we switched from gray and black garbage bags to clear garbage bags. It's very easy. It's, it's very easy to stash some contraband in a black bag and a gray bag, but it's very hard to put it in a clear bag because you can see what it is. We also bleached all of our bags before they went out to the dumpster. Still yeah, you know, you know, there's a Rubbermaid. <coughs> Take it. Anything in there is ratty. It's gone. It's denatured. It's funky, and it keeps your dumpster smelling better. So anybody who has any thoughts about, sh you know, getting some stuff going out to the dumpster has got to do a pass the clear bag test. Plus, we're going to pour a cup of bleach in that bag. Cost you about six cents. But they're not going to be out there opening those bags at 1.32 in the morning, finding the goodies that they bootlegged out. And then we had managers. We used to accumulate garbage bags at the back door and take them out every two, three hours to the dumpster with a manager. We didn't, you know, first of all, we didn't want to go out there and smoking forever and coming back and doing the 30 minutes in the parking lot. Where you been? I've been dumping the garbage. Come on, man. So the manager walked them out and walked them back in. And then we, you know, create a policy on, on, on meals and drinks and swapping. If it's not written down, they feel like there's no rules. They can do whatever they want to do. Do you all have a written thing on what they can and can't do? No questions, right? That's the way to do it. Protect all your data, lock it up. Do a need-to-know thing and then a non-compete. And if anybody wants to get a non-compete from me, I am going to leave a stack of business cards right here with my email address. If you email, say, Big Dave, give me your non-compete or give me your loss prevention document, I'll attach it and fire it right back to you. And it's just, I sign them all the time. I go to work for big chains. They want non-compete. You know, they want, it's called proprietary information. So I can't blab one chain secret to the next, which, is, which I wouldn't ethically do. But if I was an unethical person, and I'm really not. I'll do a dumpster, but I, you know, there's certain areas I don't go to. You know, that's that's information I can't share. 
Put your name on everything. This hammer was stolen from Big Dave's Pizza. How many hammers would you have rolling back in after about 10 years, right? Or this screwdriver. How come there's never a wrench when you want one? Gosh, it wasn't, the, you know, the, the toolbox was full a year ago. Now it's bone empty. And hold financially responsible for assets. And this is a legal thing. This is what I did with my drivers when we started doing the, you know, after we had the fly rod going down with 20 bags. Did you ever have a driver quit you or get fired and never bring the, never bring the car top sign back? Never, never ever happened to anybody but me? They always bring that car top sign back? Uh, they don't bring it back. They just Bags. get the money and they're gone, right? So what we did is when I hire a driver in, I give him his own sign. So I had more signs than you had, but I had one per driver, and then I had one or two spares in case for emergencies. So if you're a brand new hire, I'm going to give you a car top sign with the wire with extra bulbs. Fair? I'm going to give you a Harley Trucker's wallet. It's got the chain on it with the zipper things for coins and checks and cash. And I'm going to give you four delivery bags, number 13, 18, 26, and 14. Fair enough? Sign for them. Give me one dollar. I'm renting these to you for six months for a dollar. You with me? So he's got a $135 sign, he's got four $15 bags, and he's got a $20 leather trucker wallet. And on there, if you, on your last day of employment, or before your last paycheck is cut, you owe me what? And if you don't, you're giving me permission to withhold these out of your final check. And it's a legal contract. I never had to hunt down delivery bags or delivery signs after that. Because the onus is on him, not me. And if we pay in a two-week or one-week cycle, if he quits or he, he gets let go, he better be dumping that stuff off and getting that thing signed off or he's going to have it come out of his last check, which I could care less. If you really love that sign, it's yours. I'll get a new one for the 130 bucks. Huh? Yeah, on the uniforms it was less, less stringent because we gave everybody one shirt and then they could buy their next shirt at the local place that did them for me at, at cost. Or if they were full-time employees, I gave them two shirts, and then they had to buy backups. On trousers, we let them do anything that was a tan docker. Tan, tan yeah, anything but blue jeans, because blue jeans, well, nah, it's not there. Service. Huh? You wanted multiple service? No. No, we were dining carry-out delivery, but it was self-serve dining. They come in, paid their money, sat down, we brought their food to them. And we let them do, you know, docker shorts in the summer and docker long pants in the winter. And they had to wear leather shoes, not tennies. And the drivers got a, a shoe exemption in the wintertime with boots because it's cold and it's snowy and it's funky. So drivers can wear anything. No sneakers. No sneakers. Why not? Hmm? Why not sneakers? Uh, there's only two kinds of sneakers, like jeans. Nice and ugly. And the favorite sneakers are ugly. So this is what this is what I wore. They're leather. They're as soft as sneakers. They're more comfortable than sneakers. They're U.S. Postman marching shoes. The guy who walks, with, you know, they're really good. SAS company, about a hundred bucks a pair. If you don't have size 14 like me, if you're a regular person, you get them for like 50 bucks a pair. But these look more professional, They're, they clean up easier, they are non-skid, non-slip, and they, they can be polished and cleaned up, where a pair of sneakers go from white to gray to black to nasty, and then their toes hang out, and the thing starts to flop leather and all that, so. What do you find on 50 bucks? 50 bucks? Yeah. Oh. 140. For SAS? My guys didn't go to SAS. They went to something that was a, a knockoff, a Taiwan knockoff, or you know, Chinese knockoff. But still, they're really, they're really soft. I can be all day on concrete, and as yeah. fat and heavy as I am, my feet never hurt. They're responsible for buying that one. Yeah, and I give them a week or two to comply. You got to let them get a paycheck or two under their belt because a lot of them are walking in on fumes. Or occasionally, I would loan them 30, 40 bucks to get with the program until they got, you know, a, a little cash flow going. So my, uh, you know, I just want to, I want to have a good looking crew, a uniform looking crew, just like the pros do. This is how you go, and, and I know this is getting way off. Yeah, I mean, I apologize. no problem. I mean, I went into a, a nostalgic yesterday. 
Yeah. Piercings everywhere. Because what? Piercings. Yeah, oh, yeah. Everywhere. everywhere. What are you using that? Anybody have a problem with piercings? I, mean, I have not a problem. With <laughs> so do that again, man. I love that. You can pierce whatever you want. You just can't wait your ring pierce. I mean, I have to take them out, but I'm I mean, I mean, I mean, restaurant news. You know, that's an individual decision. If you, you know, you control, the military controls the military and you control your people if you choose to. If you choose not to, they'll control you. And if you have a, a, a rule on face tackle, uniformly, you know, enforce it. If you don't, be ready. <coughs> it's the norm. You know, in Texas, all the, all the delivery boys wear big old cowboy fat hats and these old rodeo things. You know, that's the norm in Texas. You come to New England, you wear this big ass thing with a 10 gallon hat and a buckle hat and say, where are you coming from, son? You know, it's a different, different places in the country have different norms. So pick your norm and go for it. Okay, a loss prevention statement, P&L monopoly system, camera system, prosecute thieves, tie in bonuses to financial excellence, be aware and train for violent crime. I gotta speed along because I've been going long in the mouth on this seminar here. I have a thing on my laptop called the loss prevention statement. I'm gonna kick it up as soon as this is over. And it's the 13 rules that allowed me to pay zero unemployment for the last 15 years of my career. Do you ever pay unemployment? Make you nuts. If you don't, you've got statements in place that they sign. Otherwise, the onus is on you instead of them, and you end up paying. I've got a copy, we'll show it. I'll take any questions right here, and it's 10.04, so I went four minutes over, and, and then again, I thank you. It's been a great group. I go everywhere. I go 80,000 miles a year. Uh, here's some cards. I also brought, if you're not going to catch my next seminar, feel free to grab one of these on the way out. It's called Big Bucks with Big Dave, and it's got about 25 of my best marketing things I've ever done in all my life. They're for you guys, free instead of 10 bucks. If if you uh, if you do a survey, you fill one of these out. I'll give you a book on the way out. Fair enough. I'll set these on the back door and give them to Carolyn. You've been a great group, and I thank, thank you, you, and I'll help you. Also, easy phone number there. Ready? One.